Hello, everyone. Welcome to the special Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of the Cube, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. We are at Erica Brescia, the C, co-founder and chief operating officer of Bitnami. It's the app store for the cloud. They do automated packaging of an application provider. Great to see you, Cube alumni. Great to have you in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, so much going on. You've been in the Cube multiple times. We see each other at conferences, and, and you made some time. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate it. Yeah. So Bitnami is doing, doing some great things. So give us the update. What's going on with the company? Sure. So we just launched our new offering called Stacksmith, which is our first enterprise offering that basically takes all the tooling that we've built to deliver the uh, application catalog that we have onto all the major cloud vendors and allows enterprise IT departments to package up their own applications, both for cloud and cloud native platforms, as well as for whatever they're running in the enterprise today. So it kind of meets them where they are, helps them automate the application packaging and maintenance in place today, and then sets them up to successfully move to the cloud and Kubernetes and containers over time. So it's kind of reverse of this journey to the cloud. You go to where the user customers are, help them put it together. And make and the journey really. So what we find is a lot of the more traditional um, orchestration and packaging tools just aren't well suited to cloud and containers in particular. And so enterprises are looking for new tools to help them solve current problems, which is we need to support all these different platforms. We might have some things running internally in VMware, we're running some things on Amazon, maybe using CloudFormation, and now they're trying to get to Kubernetes and they're trying to figure out how they can do that without having a separate pipeline for everything. And that's the problem that Bitnami solves. Yeah, and that's been a bit, we've identified a problem. I got Amazon, then I want Azure, I want Google Cloud, I got to hire a different development team, different stacks. So there's kind of this problem with multi-cloud. How are you guys talking to customers about that? Because this seems to be the hybrid cloud um, main problem today. So, okay, I see the cloud, I understand I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing a lot of stuff in the cloud, or mm -hmm. cloud's going to be on-prem and it's going to be in the cloud. How do I get ready for the cloud? That seems to be a number one question. Yeah, and I think what people are struggling with is, you know, there are a lot of companies out there, particularly in the cloud native space, that just say, if you just rebuild everything, then your life will be so much better, right? But that's not really realistic for most companies. They need to be able to take what they have and be able to package it in such a way that they get a lot of the benefits of the cloud and containers without completely re-architecting everything. Because it might be practical for, say, a new startup or a company like Netflix or Spotify to do that, but let's face it, most companies are not that. Most companies have uh, too many demands on their IT and ops teams already. Hiring talent is hard even for the startups working <laughs> at the forefront of yeah. Kubernetes. So you really need tools that are approachable and solve current problems. But again, I think the key is set you up for success in the future. And I think we help people kind of bridge the gap between what they're doing today and what they're doing in the future without trying to push them in one direction, yeah. um, which might not make sense for them. Yeah, and then Netflix and the, and the Googles in the, of the world are, are potentially future scenarios of what they might look like, but they got to take care of the current move from IT to cloud, get ready for it. Yeah, maybe, and you know, for a lot of these internal applications, it doesn't make sense to completely re-architect and rewrite them. Like, the ROI isn't there, and there are companies out there that have thousands of Java or .NET applications that they just need to be able to move perhaps out of their data center. In many cases, it's being shut down and uh, onto cloud platforms. And so we try to get, find that nice balance between helping you get the advantage of the automation of cloud without having to invest in re-architecting apps that just aren't worth re-architecting. I got to ask you, Erica, you, we've had a couple conversations. I forget what year you were founded at Bitnami, but you had a great journey. A lot of things yeah. have changed. Yeah. When did you guys found it? 2010 or 2011? So we started Bitnami in 2013. The okay. company before Bitnami was Bitrock, and we went through a Y Combinator in 2013, and that's when we really started growing out the company. First around the app catalog that we deliver both via bitnami.com as well as all the major cloud platforms, and that's allowed us to bootstrap the business up to this point, um, and then obviously, we took all of the learnings and the technology from delivering 140 applications across 14 different platforms, native and cloud, and productize that in Stacksmith. So our enterprise users, you know, we have over a million deployments a month, but people have only been consuming the things that we build. Now they can use our tooling that we've been building out over the years to automate the packaging of their own applications. And, it's, and just to kind of put some color commentary around that time, it wasn't the most 
calm waters in the cloud world. It's been massive growth. Yeah. A lot of things have happened. You saw containers mm -hmm. come to the scene with Docker and then become standardized. Now you got Kubernetes, you got service meshes right around the corner. Kind of now sets a perfect opportunity for you guys to bring customers to the with this app store concept. Yeah, you guys. And, and we see this great, we call it kind of the great unbundling, right? Where apps used to be distributed with the operating system and they kind of were this one cohesive piece and now with Kubernetes and cloud APIs, the applications are very separate. And so there's kind of this new operating system coming together, which is the operating system of containers and Kubernetes and cloud. And it allows you to combine these different pieces in ways that you never could before. Before, you know, you would just go to your OS repo to pull in the app yeah. that you wanted. And yeah. you see in the trends, I mean, Google has the SRE concept, Site Reliability Engineer. Mm -hmm. The operators on the VMware side are used to dealing with VMs, yep. kind of all converging together. So I got to ask you, I mean, how does that impact your customers? So with your new Stacksmith offering, what's the impact of the customers? Is it ease of use, is it ease of deployment? What's the main uh, value add? So I think the most important thing is, as you said, there are all these new technologies coming out and there's also cloud formation on AWS and there's ARM on Azure and each cloud vendor is coming out with their own tooling and then like you said, there, there's oper operators for Kubernetes. Um, the, the advantage that you get with Bitnami is you don't have to understand the intricacies of how to package for all of those different platforms because we do that for you. We abstract away having to understand how to build a cloud formation template versus a helm chart. Helps the Kubernetes you know, package manager essentially and we've been very involved in helping define and further that project. We're actually the top provider of the official Helm charts. Um, so we see a lot of promise there, but what's interesting about Bitnami is at the end of the day, we're platform agnostic. And once you start using Bitnami and Stacksmith, you can very easily add support for other platforms. So we have a customer who started out on AWS, for example, they wanted to give a try to running some things on Azure, and they essentially just had to flip a switch, and then they get an ARM template instead of- What was their alternative to that? If they didn't do that, what would they have to do? They would have had to do it either manually or find system specific tools for each platform to do it. So there's no other like singular tool chain that lets right. you build natively for all the different platforms. And that's the key. We don't try to abstract away ARM or any of these other orchestration technologies by giving you some kind of layer on top of them. Yeah. We just make it really easy to build for those technologies and also to maintain those applications and templates over time. So this isn't a point in time thing. We track all of the updates in everything that goes into that image or set of images and allow you to automatically rebuild and redeploy across any of those platforms you need to support. You guys have been very successful in the cloud, but also have scar tissue like everybody else that's been through the cloud wars <laughs> and now as it starts to hit kind of an inflection point, how has cloud changed now? What are we seeing, what are we seeing now in cloud you know, versus say 2014, 2015 oh boy. time frame? So I think the most interesting thing is how quickly uh, Azure in particular has evolved. If I had to pick one thing that has been incredibly impressive and important in the changing cloud landscape, it's, you know, you go back to 2014, it was pretty much all AWS all the time, right? And Amazon isn't quite the Goliath that used to be anymore. Well, I mean, they're, st damn big as they're still ask. huge. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But I'll tell you what, the others are gaining a lot of ground and they have really interesting and different advantages, right? Google will send all of their amazingly smart engineers in to help you architect applications or move them over. I have heard of a lot of workloads moving off of AWS onto Google because Google is giving them so much love and support and trying to attract those workloads over. But Azure's advantage is their ecosystem, right? They really understand partnering in a way that Amazon's retail DNA, just it, it doesn't lend itself to that. And so I think Microsoft's approach to building out a really great yeah. ecosystem around Azure, coupled with their huge field sales team, yeah. which Amazon has just been building, they'd never had an enterprise sales team, is making things really interesting and creating, for us, a great dynamic in the market because yeah. we'd like to see a number of cloud vendors dealer, for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, any cloud. I don't know if our CMO <laughs> yeah. would want me to put it that way, but. <laughs> Dave Vellante's favorite term, by the way. Sure. Um, it's good to be an arms dealer, or be Switzerland as they, to be more politically Yeah, we go, we go with Switzerland. Um, 
Azure is interesting. I was just having a conversation uh, with Dave about this because you know, you got the consumerization of IT and digital transformation have been the biggest buzzwords in IT for the past decade. Mm -hmm. First was the consumerization of IT, now it's digital transformation. Oh, if yeah. you think about it, Amazon and Google are really the consumer companies. Mm -hmm. Azure's the enterprise company yep. with the ecosystem. So it's going to be very interesting to see if consumerization is the winning formula or is it digital transformation on the enterprise side? It's going to be We'll be watching that pretty closely. Your thoughts? So I would say on the consumerization of IT side, I mean, that is absolutely happening. And there we could talk for hours probably on why that, that trend is here and why it's not going away. Just expectations in general have changed with the advent of the iPhone and app stores and convenience across every aspect of our lives. So I think even Microsoft gets that, and I, I don't think that the consumer DNA of those companies actually gives them a real edge in this case. What is interesting is every company is starting to really focus on their app stores and their marketplace strategies and trying to provide a fric frictionless buying experience. Yeah. And there are a bunch of announcements coming both on the AWS side and the, the Azure side on, in particular around things that they're doing to ease the enterprise buying process. Well, we identify the three things. SaaS business is table stakes. IOT is coming, connected devices. Uh, and then you got the mobile. Mm -hmm. Not going, those, things, those three things are 20 year runs. Yep. I talk about Bitnami's um, uh, update. You mentioned um, Stacksmith. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some new stuff there. You guys are hiring. What's the ramp up? Yeah. Funding, so, cash flow, <laughs> top line revenues. Yeah, Go ahead, <laughs> I'm share. not giving you all that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a really exciting time for us, obviously, bringing this enterprise product to market. Um, we're gearing up to scale quite significantly. So, Bitnami is kind of unusual in the valley in that we're bootstrapped and we're very heavily engineering driven. So, we no have, outside funding. A uh, million dollars in total, which pretty much doesn't even count in Silicon Valley. And that was really just to the number of key individual folks involved in the company so when no we venture. went through YC. No, no institutional funding. So um, we are just getting ready to build out the whole go-to-market team around the Stacksmith product, which is very new in the market, just launched in the last couple months. So is it generally available so, or is oh it yes, really Generally available, okay. customers, lots of great things to talk about, but we don't have the full sales team in and place. And what's the benefits of, of Stacksmith? What's the bottom line uh, value proposition? It's really helping you to automate the packaging and maintenance of your applications, whether internal or external, you know, third party commercial apps that you're using internally and uh, deploying them on any of the platforms that you need to support. App Store for the cloud, I love that. <laughs> so let's talk about what you're working on. One of the things I'm really impressed with, I'm really impressed with what you've done with Bitnami, I love it. Thank love you. Love the bootstrap stories. We're bootstrapped as well as everyone knows uh, SiliconANGLE. Um, so it's great, in Silicon Valley, I think that's like the, the top, top tier uh, you know, player, if you can bootstrap and to, to uh, economic visibility around scale, that's a success, so congratulations. But you also have something exciting going on with venture investing. Yes. X Factor. <laughs> X Factor, yeah. This is super impressive. You've raised a small little fund, mm -hmm. X Factor, investing in women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Take a minute to explain what X Factor is and you have some news coming, another fund coming? Sure, yeah, it's been very exciting. So in the free time that I really don't have, but this is such a good cause that it's worth it. Um, we put together a $3 million fund to invest $100,000 in 30 different companies in, um, with at least one female founder. And this actually was uh, spun out of Flybridge. We have our token guy, as we call him, Chip Hazard, who's a, a, uh, a career venture investor who's doing a lot of interesting things. But he basically led the charge with a woman named Anna Palmer to put together a group of female founders, that's what really differentiates us, I think, from the rest of the market, who are operating their own companies to invest in these very early stage uh, female founded companies. And I think that gives us a really unique advantage in the market of venture, in that first, we have an incredible pipeline and deal flow because you know we know these folks who are starting the companies. And we also have a unique perspective on the challenges of getting a new venture off the ground and I think we can really be an ally to the entrepreneurs that we're funding in helping them get you know, that first bit of funding in the door. We typically help them with their series A rounds and beyond, and they really see us as, as a peer and someone that they can relate to and come to for advice. And so I think it's a pretty unique value prop that we have as, as a VC fund. Well, operating experience brings a lot to the table. So exactly. they want to get those first three steps going, get that, get the venture off the ground, mm -hmm. trust. 
Yeah, and we have a very diverse range of experiences that we can bring to bear too. I mean, some of us have deep infrastructure experience. Some folks are on the consumer side. We've got a few East Coast people, a few West Coast people, a few people scattered in other areas. Um, and we all have different areas of expertise, right? I'm pretty strong on the business development side and on business model, SaaS, enterprise software. Some of the other women are much more familiar with like distribution deals or hardware deals or, or other consumer businesses as well. So I think we have a really unique range of experiences and expertise that we can bring to bear in supporting our yeah. founders. And mentoring too, and some being there for, you know, don't give up, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we've had thing. founders go through things and they'll call us, at one of our founders I was just on the phone with and she was looking at changing her role within the company to take on more responsibility and we had a great conversation around that and it resulted in her becoming the COO. Um, which was fantastic. Another founder was going through a difficult time where she and her co-founder were splitting up and I was able to talk her through that. And we have a lot of those stories where I think, you know, we have really been seen as an ally who can help founders get through those times because we've been there and, and we can empathize. And it's an interesting dynamic because everybody knows that we're not going to invest in the next round. So there's never any posturing to make sure that, you know, they're still selling us on investing in the company. It's all about once we're in, we're in and we'll do anything we can do to help yeah. you scale successfully over time. And the key is get that next round or get clear line of sight on visibility on the unit economics or scale. Exactly. All right, so how much is coming in the next fund? Can you talk about the, the amount or? Yeah, so we're not raising yet. We're just about to start raising. We're going to be expanding the number of investment partners on the team, which is fantastic. And I'm really excited to bring some amazing new women on board. So, you know, for the women out there who are, um, maybe interested in starting to learn a little bit more about venture and have uh, raised funding and built their own companies, um, please send us an email. Uh, hello at X Factor Ventures. Um, the fund should be about $10 million as and a current target. how is it structured? Is it they structured as limited partners, general partners? How is it, so if someone comes on board, mm -hmm. as you expand the partnership, what does it look like? Sure, so um, we all do invest our own money, but the fund has LPs just like any other fund. Um, so there's a number of great folks who have backed up X Factor. We do bring in some of our own folks along the way. You know, I had people that I know who have invested in the fund, and I'm sure that will be the case in the next one. Um, but it's not like the fund is only funded by the investment partners. We have LPs just like but any other fund. But you guys are fund. taking profits out of it through the carry, right? Mm -hmm. So in typical yeah, yeah. Of venture capital. It's typical venture capital. You know, it's a fairly small fund to start as we work through things, but we expect it to grow quite significantly over time. And I'll tell you without giving away too much that we have quite grand ambitions for the long term. All right, well let's keep in touch on the deal flow. Congratulations on Bitnami and we'll see you at the cloud shows, uh, Amazon, <laughs> Microsoft Ignite, Google Next. Everywhere, <laughs> yep, I'll be there. Erica, thanks for coming on and spending some time here in theCUBE. CUBE Conversations here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, you're watching CUBE Conversations. Thanks for watching.